last class, we finished off with voluntary accountability. And that subject really sets us up for the, um, uh, the principle of spiritual fathers. And then the principle of spiritual fathers really sets us up to discuss affiliation. Okay? And then after we talk about affiliation, then we'll talk about ordination. So that's where we're headed. We're not going to get all, that all in tonight. Uh, but we are going to talk about uh, the principle of spiritual fathers, and then we'll probably cover affiliation uh, uh, pretty thoroughly uh, this evening. And I'm glad we've got a few people that have worked and pastored in affiliates, and maybe they can, they can help us tonight, and we can have some discussion and conversation. Uh, but here we go. Um, we're going to turn. You don't have to turn there because I'm going to read the verse, but... Um, we're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and we're going to start off with this text here. But the first thing I want to say about this subject of spiritual fathers is that uh, some people might teach it a little bit differently than I do. You might hear it a little bit differently from uh, Pastor Schaller or Pastor Shabelli. I'm not saying that for a fact. I don't know. I haven't heard them speak on it so much. But if you were to hear it a little bit different, that wouldn't indicate that there's disagreements within uh, Greater Grace World Outreach about it. It's just there's different ways of thinking about it, and we're all in this together trying to hear from God and, and operate in the way that he'd want us to go. Uh, but I view this not as a doctrine, but as a principle, okay? And it's a principle that we, we still see illustrated uh, throughout uh, scriptures. But if you wanted to go to the source text, of it, and it's really, I think, maybe one of the few times it's mentioned, it would be in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And uh, Paul is uh, speaking to the Corinthians, and he is telling them how he wants that church to be thinking about him and about who he is. And it starts off in uh, you know, chapter 3, talking about uh, uh, Apollos. And, uh, you know, his, his ministry and uh, that, you know, some have planted, some have watered. And, and there, were, there were like parties within that church saying, I'm of, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Peter. And then the very spiritual people are saying, oh, no, I'm of Jesus, you know, I, I'm of Jesus. So we had these, this going on in the church. And, and Paul is speaking to them and saying, look, it is not that way. We're, we're all servants for Jesus' sake. And then he gets to this uh, part here. He talks about how the apostles are really last, starting off in verse 9. We're fools for Christ's sake in verse 10. And um, <clears throat> verse 14, he says, I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. And even though I'm saying maybe this is the only uh, verse that talks about uh, father, the spiritual father, there are a number of places where, where Paul re refers to people as his sons, right? So maybe this is more in the scripture than just in one place. But um, I, write, I don't want to shame you, but I want to warn you. In verse 15, for though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. And wherefore I beseech you, be you followers of me. And these, this passage here is like awesome. And, but as you read the New Testament, you'll just see these themes and what relates uh, to what we're talking about tonight really throughout the scripture in a way that I think uh, churches maybe have, have lost sight of a little bit. So you have 10,000 teachers. Is that what it says, 10,000 or 1,000? Um, you have 10,000 instructors in Christ but you do not have many fathers. And you can read this a certain way. You do not have plural fathers. You have one father in the faith. You can read it that way. And when you think about Paul's ministry in Corinth, uh, he went there, met Aquila and Priscilla, and then he stayed there for a year and a half teaching and preaching, and then he left 
And now this letter is written back to the Corinthians. And the way I think about this passage, and you can think about it differently, and you might be right, but the way I think about this passage is that it is written to the church uh, in Corinth so that there's going to be people in that church who came in after Paul left, and maybe they were instructed by some of these other individuals, you know, discipled or, or other, these other men were their uh, pastor. But Paul is writing to the whole church and saying, look, you've got a lot of instructors, but you only have one father. Um, the way I would interpret this is sort of in the broad interpretation is um, I'm the guy who founded the church and laid the foundation. That, certainly, that thought certainly is said specifically back in chapter 3. And in that sense, I am the father of the church in Corinth. And guys, there's really only one of me. Okay, and you have other instructors there, but I'm like an important individual. And I'm, I'm not, I don't say this to shame you, uh, but I'm warning you of, as sons, as beloved sons, I'm warning you, and I want you to be followers of me. Now listen to this thing. Listen to this verse 17 now. Um, so you've got, and I, I don't know specifically what was going on in that church at that time, but for this cause, I'm sending you Timothy. So I have to take it that in Corinth there was some sort of leadership in place that had been you know, ordained, left behind, was pastoring the church. But Paul's saying, look, I'm seeing some problems in this church with these party spirits. And then, you know, the, this book, whole book is about problems. And I'm going to send, like Timothy, my personal representative, and he's going to come to you. He's my beloved son. I'm warning you as beloved sons. He's my beloved son, and he's faithful in the Lord. And he is going to bring you into remembrance of my ways which are in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. Okay? So there's a, a principle here where, where Paul is really presenting himself as a father of the church and certainly as a spiritual father of some of the people there. And this this, uh, this principle is really what we're talking about when we're talking about spiritual fathers, but we're really going to focus very specifically on my relationship or your relationship with the people that have raised you up in the faith. And I think in, I, I've got Pastor uh, Ben here. He's from another, uh, really another culture. And I'm sure that in your time here, you could make some very interesting commentary on what you see in this country and, and what things are like uh, it, where you come from, and maybe some others. I don't know what other cultures are like. I know that in this country, young is good, old is bad. You know, that we do not gather around old people to get wisdom from them, okay? We laugh at them because they don't know how to, how to operate cell phones or, the, or computers. That's what we do in this country. And it's, it's like this amazing thing that goes on here. And I think in some ways that's a great strength to our country, that we are innovative, we can grasp new technologies, jump into new areas. But in some ways, especially in the church, I think we lose a lot, or lose much. And um, I, this is not a law, but it's just a, a thought that's, in, that's consistent and sort of illustrates um, what uh, just something that's important to us. At, at age, I'm in my early 50s now. And when I was 45 years old, I did not have a capacity to teach this class well. And it's just because you learn and you grow, you know. And, and, and that when I was, let me just go back in, in history here, it was my very early 40s, we had a church, uh, you know, in the church I was in at that time, I forget the year right now, um, late 30s, early 40s, there was a church breakup um, and I knew that at that point in time, I was not going to be a guy that was, was, had any interest whatsoever in, in pastoring that church because I knew I was just not the guy to do it. And it, not so much in chronological age, but in terms of maturity, the church needed someone beyond me, you know. And, and I think that there are some people who at very young ages are, are capable and gifted by God and can pastor churches, and if you're one of those people, and, and, and we lay hands on you and send you out, I'm all for it. We've got uh, you know, Ben Tangy in Hamden, not ordained, pastoring a church, uh, being, being offered to pastor it possibly, and it's like awesome if that happens. But I'm just saying there's maturity that can come in, 
And, and we can think about ourselves, like if you think you have it in you to pastor a church, um, that maybe you're going to give God some decades to prepare you for that, and you're not going to put him on a short timetable, and that as time goes on, you will find yourself being able to handle people and able to handle situations in ways that you could never have done in your 20s, and that you, you just have a lot more to offer. And by the same token, I'm just looking at my peers, and I could, I could name some of these guys, and I, I hope I'm not doing anybody a disservice, but I take a guy like Pastor Kim Shibley. He was over uh, on the team in uh, France for some years. Maybe some of you were part of that, maybe not. Then he came back uh, to uh, 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 the Baltimore area some years ago. He was just a, a guy in the church, uh, you know, working a job, supporting a large family, working as a salesman, you know, keeping a roof over everybody's, over everybody's head. And then we planted the church in Silver Spring, and then he stepped into that pulpit, and it's like, oh, my goodness gracious. I didn't know who this guy was, but then it became suddenly apparent, you know, well on in years, not a young man anymore. This guy is, like, amazing, and he's, he's you know, in God's, you know, prepared place and prepared vessel. He steps in, and the church is, like, blossoming and awesome, you know. And I look at um, Pastor, uh, you, know, you know, a guy I work closely with, uh, Pastor Roger Robbins. Maybe some of you have him in foundations. Very much a behind-the-scenes guy, out knocking on doors on Saturdays, small Bible studies and projects in Baltimore with five and ten people. And then he gets the call to go over and assist, uh, you know, you know, to go to Turkey, a uh, uh, certain city in Turkey, and uh, preach for two weeks, assisting a, you know, a well-known missionary pastor there. And it's like, and it just comes out who you are, even though maybe day in and day out, it's like, you know, what am I doing? And you're just a behind-the-scenes guy. And, and, and so I just be thinking about it that way. But also I'm saying that to illustrate that people that are older than us can have a lot to offer. And in the church, we do not want to be writing off guys who are in their 50s and 60s and 70s just because they're not pastoring a church of 100 or 1,000 people. There are awesome people with tons to offer. If you were to sit, how many people have ever spoken to Pastor Lou Kallenbeck? Okay. Okay. How many people have never spoken to Pastor Lou? Okay. Okay. So you, you don't even know who he is. You know? you, I'm just telling you, sit down, you know, go meet Pastor Lou and say, Pastor Taggart said I should come meet you. Before you die. No, don't, don't tell him that. But I just, the guy's like amazing. He's like amazing. He was with Pastor Stevens, you know, you know before a lot of us were born up in Wiscasset and, and some of those places. And he was, you know, when I, when I went to Lenox in the old days, 1976, he was the guy in charge of my dorm, just in the trenches, you know, loving, fighting, you know, all this stuff. And, and these, these treasures are out there and they're amazing people. So... <clears throat> Um, that's just as an aside to all us Americans who always want to look to the young and exciting, that maybe we can gain something by, by looking to the old. So there's a principle, uh, not a doctrine, but I'm just telling you what's behind it. Now, the second thing I want to say, and this is why the principle of voluntary accountability really sets us up for the uh, principle of spiritual fathers, is I really view it as being a matter of the heart um, and a matter of, uh, of choice. Um, and it's, in a sense, it's a choice, and we'll get into how it's not a choice, but it really is my decision if I'm going to have a relationship uh, with my spiritual father. It's, it's voluntary, and uh, it's, I view it much like um, um, my relationship that I have or that we have with our own fathers. And again, especially in this country, um, you know, kids grow up and they want to go out and strike out on their own and they want to, you know, uh, you know, move to the big city, whatever they do, go out and make their way in the world. And, and people in this country tend to, not in all cases, and there's many, many uh, exceptions that say they move away from their parents and the relationship with the parents becomes a phone call once a month or a letter once every two months. And in that sense, there's, there's nothing in the world that makes, me, that makes me call my dad other than something that's in my heart that I value that relationship and want to be uh, gleaning from it and investing in it. And that's why this is, is so vital 
Um, and along with that same thought, the reason it's so vital is we have to own this inside of us because we're really the ones that have to make it happen. And as I said last class, and I really thought it came out well, I don't know if I can say it as well again tonight, but my, you know, if I have a spiritual father, and I think, you know, I, I think we can have more than one person who plays that role in our life just because of different men you know, and women in some cases who invest in us, it's like he, generally speaking, is not going to chase me. He might, but there's going to come a point where it's going to be like if, if my relationship with this individual is not in his heart, I cannot make it happen, and I'm not going to impose myself on this individual and make him have a relationship with me. I'm going to back off, and if it's in his heart and he comes to me, the, the, the door is wide open. But it's, it's, like a, it's like a parent calling a child and saying, how come you never call me? You know, That would be like a nagging parent, and that would like bother us. And I know maybe some of your parents do that. My parents don't do that to me. So, you know, sometimes I, I think they should. Um, but I, actually, no, I, I'll tell you. I'll tell you the story just to, just to illustrate it. There was a situation recently with, with my own parents. And here's how it went. Um, I got a gift from my parents. And it was, it was very generous. I was very appreciative. And it like stunned me in such a way that I wasn't, it wasn't just like I just wanted to call and say, hey, thanks, Mom and Dad, because that didn't do it justice. You know? So I was sort of plotting and scheming in my mind um, that uh, how am I going to, you know, what's going to be appropriate? I don't want to overdo it. I don't want to underdo it. But I also was thinking, you know, just knowing my dad, he doesn't want to make a big deal out of it because my dad's a very low-key guy. And then I had written a thank you note, but I hadn't mailed it yet. And then I got a call from my dad, which I, I, I would never have expected this. And this is going around the world, I know. And my dad's there like, geez, uh, did you even receive this thing? And I haven't heard from you. And is there a problem? You know? And it's like, oh my God, I cannot believe I did this to my father. I cannot believe I'm in this situation. So I'm like apologizing all over the place. Just, I'm so sorry about this. And honestly, it was just like I was so appreciative. I wasn't sure how to respond. And, and that's why I didn't respond. But no, I'm very thankful. And I, I took the letter that I'd written, put it in a FedEx envelope, overnighted it up, up, up there. You know, they, they, they got it. And then I called the next day to make sure they got it. And then my dad gets on the phone with me. Yes, we got it. Oh, Pete, you didn't have to do that. No big deal. And it's like, so he was like, you know what I'm saying? So he put himself in a situation where he was in, kind of embarrassed to have called me up and say, is there a problem? But I was rightly embarrassed that I had not responded to him. But that, that's like how it goes. You know what I'm saying? If, if I'm imposing myself on somebody, I'm going to end up in a situation I don't want to be in, you know? Um, but on the other side, if, if, I'm, if, if there's someone that, they got, that, that I should have or be maintaining a relationship with because of what God has done in both of our hearts and I failed to do it, then I should be corrected in that. And that's why, we have this, that's why we're talking about this tonight. Because uh, in, in Prince, I mean, in a large group, how do I say this? Your spiritual father is never going to come to you uh, personally and teach you this because he shouldn't have to and he doesn't want to. So someone who's not your spiritual father, me, is going gonna, is gonna to pound you with it so, so it's in your heart and then you apply it you know, as you go out through your life in, in a way so no one else has to come to you and say, what's, what's the matter here? Is there a problem? Because you don't ever want to get that phone call. You know what I'm saying? So it's, it's a matter of the heart <clears throat> and it's God places me with people to raise me up in the Lord, okay? And this is something that God does, and I know it when he does it. At least I hope I know it. And that's why everybody here, or the vast majority of us, I look at the people in this room, and by and large, we have come from around the world at great price to be here. It didn't just happen that we're in Baltimore. I know some of us were raised here, but I know your parents, and your parents just didn't happen to be in Baltimore. They came here at a cost in, in, in most cases. And so we, we've, we've come from, you know, your, your wife came from across the country, right? You know, she saw us on the internet. It's like the pearl of great price. She moves from California to be in Baltimore. It's like, who would do that except a person called by God to be here? So, so God places me with these people. And, and you know, my statement about Pastor Schaller, I'm not 
like proud of it or ashamed of it, but just for illustration, I remember when I met him in uh, 1981, uh, I'm, I got out of college, moved back to Lenox, and he came back from the mission field, and he was installed in an office up in you know, the administration building in the missions office. And I met him, and it's just the character of the man was such as, like, my statement is I've been under Pastor Schaller ever since I met him. And God did that. He's never, he's never told me that. He never would tell me that. He probably thinks of me as a brother, but I think of him as a person that I can glean from and benefit from, and I want to be, I'm very happy to be submitting my life to this man because I think he knows more than I do, and, and I can benefit from that relationship even though he never tells me what to do, even when I ask, okay? So, next point. This is something that God does. God does it and not men, okay? And I think of the, uh, the statement in the Bible about marriage, uh, what, what God has joined together, lot, let, not man put, let not man divide asunder, okay? And that I know the verse, I know that's talking about marriage, but I also think there's a principle there that can apply, which when, when God puts something together, men don't rip it apart, okay? So God does it, and not men, but God doing it, it's a matter of the heart. It's something that God has put inside of me. And I don't go to the guy and say, you're my spiritual father. I mean, I'm not that I shouldn't, but my actions will, will speak whether that's the case or not. And in some cases, and I'm just saying this, over the years, some of the people that I've heard talk the loudest about their great relationship with their spiritual father and how important it was, I, I just had a sense, and, then, and, I'm, and in some cases I've been wrong, but not, not that I need to be right or wrong, but I, I had a sense as those statements were being made is that there was some sort of insecurity there. And that's why this guy had to keep on making these statements about the great relationship with the spiritual father is to cover up some sort of insecurity. And then later on, all these vows and statements they've made about how I would, I would never leave this man and all this stuff, they disappear in a moment. So I, just in terms of, of going, going public with it and, and talking about it, I think we want to talk about the principle in a class like this. but. But we don't need to be, you know, um, going to Pastor so and so and saying you're spirit, my spiritual father, and, and having that type of conversation because if it's in your heart, it'll be there, and if it's not, it's not. And all the words in the world don't don't make a difference. And it's not a badge of spirituality, right? You may find yourself in a place in your life where those people in your life are gone, and I hope it never happens to you, but it could. Okay, and, and how, how could it go? It's like you're maybe, I'm just trying to think how this could go. Uh, you're in a church somewhere, and the guy who, who planted your church, uh, suddenly he changes his doctrine, you know, and he, and he goes off on, you know, he, he goes against what he's taught you for 10 or 20 years. He, he decides he's going to try something new. And the doctrine that he changes on is so crucial that it's like you can't go with it and you don't even want to be the inf under the influence of it anymore, okay? So you're left out there in this church with your people, and the, and the people that you were looking up to are suddenly, no you can no longer look up to them because they are not the people that you were looking up to anymore. And there you are, and it's like, God, I am on my own. Either you gotta give me grace to carry on with, 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 this, with this body here in, in, the, in the doctrine that I've learned and I've been committed to for my whole life, or you gotta give me someone else and you gotta leave me, leave me. But you can be alone in that situation. It's, it's possible you could find yourself without a spiritual father, okay? So this is a, this is a person uh, who, I'm, who God uses to raise me up into maturity. And he does it by teaching me, and he does it by uh, you know, me being near him and, and just observing him in situations. And that's, that's the great, uh, great benefits of, of, of having these people that you can be close to, because I'm just telling you, uh, you can be taught certain things, but how you see people handle situations is going to affect you just as much. You'll, you'll find those things without ever even learning it on purpose. It will come back to you. You'll see them handle a certain person in a certain way at a certain time, and you'll say, you know what? Um, uh, I... Uh, you know, it'll just stick with you. And then you'll find yourself two years later, hey, wait a minute, I'm, I've seen this situation before. This is how so-and-so handled it. 
And um, I'm going to handle it that same way with some confidence here because that's how a person I respect handled it. Okay, now, why would I ever separate uh, from the person who has raised me up in the Lord? Okay, and I would say that there's three reasons. Uh, uh, reason number one is because I change. Okay, this is a, a bad reason for separating. Okay. He continues in the doctrine uh, that he's been teaching me. I've, I've been learning this doctrine. And there is a principle, and I, I can throw it in here, and I, I might throw it in in other places in this course also. But this is something and I, uh, that I'm just going to say because I think it may save us down the future. Is in principle, when you see a doctrine change in a person, I'm not saying always, but in the spiritual principle, there's been a lifestyle change that has preceded the doctrinal change. Okay, uh, So and so uh, feels like he wants to do certain things in his life. He wants to entertain thoughts that he should not be entertaining. He wants the right to have a beer in his refrigerator or, or a bottle of wine in his refrigerator and drink in the privacy of his own home because the Bible says a little wine is good for the stomach. You know what I'm saying? That, that's what he wants to be able to do. You know? um, maybe he, there may be, you know, I don't know, gossip. Maybe there's some, some envy, and he wants, to, he wants the right to, to, to think something bad about uh, you know, someone who's being promoted in the Lord, you know, and just hold that in his heart. Like, and so there's some, some lifestyle thing that's going on, and then that's covered up by a change in doctrine. You know what? I read this book. And it was written by so-and-so, who's a professor in a very good seminary. And he looks at it this way. And I think that we need, I, I, that, I think, I'm going to think that way. And in fact, I'm going to start talking about it openly because it's very important to me. And uh, I'm going to say this, and again, you might hear it taught differently. Uh, we encourage people in our church to be, you know, Pastor Schaller is not afraid of other portions. He wants us to be reading books. Um, there, there is an academic table where we can sit down and talk about things. And it's not that you can't be thinking about certain ideas. You can't be thinking about this, this um, theologian or that theologian. But it's that when those ideas become a source of I'm going to make a difference, like this becomes important, like this difference is important to me now. And I need to take a stand on greater grace is wrong, and I am right, and I need to start going public. That's, that's the danger sign. That is the danger sign. Now, when I think about the doctrines of greater grace church, do I disagree with any of them? Out of the whole range of it, I could maybe think of one thing that is, is rarely taught, you know, that I might look at it a little bit different, you know. I, I know I read, uh, we, we recommend uh, uh, Dr. Chafer's um, you know, systematic theology, you know, six volumes, three volumes, whatever that is. Um, and we, we pretty much are, are very good with that, that um, you know, that, that book of theology. But as, as I read him, he says that uh, he looks at uh, the first day of the week as being the Lord's Day and the day that, that we should be celebrating our church services. I personally don't look at it that way. I look at it like, you know, in, in, in America, Sunday's a day off. It's a great day for a church service. Yes, it, it is the first day of the week. Yes, it's the day of the resurrection. It's a great day to have a church service, but if some church wanted to have their services on Tuesday and not Sunday, I could care less about that. I don't think they're going against anything there. But Dr. Chafe would be a little bit stronger on that. So maybe I'm just, I'm just giving an example of a minor doctrine. Like why would I, I mean, I'm giving it to you as an illustration, but you're the first, I've never said this in my life to anybody because I don't care. Why would I raise that up and make a difference and, 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 and have it become like very important unless being divisive was like important to me. And why on earth would I want to be divisive unless there's something wrong in my heart? And, 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 and why, why would I have something wrong in my heart unless there was something I was, I was uh, like holding very dear to me that I didn't want to give up and don't want to be found out and want, want to make an excuse for going in a different direction, okay? And this, this like what I just said there, this like very, very, very important. And because you are going to be in situations in the future where there's going to be doctrinal changes going to be talked about. Maybe in some affiliate ministry. God forbid it'll happen in, in home base. Uh, God forbid you'll be tempted by it. Maybe you've been tempted by it in the past. 
And you got to make sure you just, just please, you know, um, be careful of this. So reason number one for separation is because I change. I outgrow my teacher. I know better than him. You know, um, you know I was in a, when I was in university, I was in another state, not in a greater grace church. And that church was really, had come out of a, of a church split of a well-known ministry. And I came back, and I don't know if any of you remember Wilma Rutledge. She's gone home to be with the Lord now. But I was just telling her the church I was in. And actually, I actually came out of a church split from this other church. And uh, Wilma's comment was, is people forget who taught them their ABCs. You know what I'm saying? That was, that was what she said. I just thought that was very, very wise. I don't want to outgrow my teachers. You know, you guys, have you guys seen Pastor Anderson in service? Sits over and, and I just see that guy. I just want to weep at his feet. You know what I'm saying? Because he paid the price. You know, he, he's taught, he, was in, he was in Lennox, just loving people. He's been doing it his whole life. A gentle man, gray-haired. He is, he is not one of these people. He is just a, 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 a fountain of wisdom and kindness and generosity and prayer. Been through a lot, paid the price, stayed the course, an amazing guy. I don't ever want to outgrow that man. You know, and I just, it's, I'm a little bit weird about it, but it's like, it's like he's, you know, he's one of these, when I see him in church, it's like, I got to go over and just like acknowledge it. It's like kiss his ring or something, you know, because I just, I just want to honor him because he is to be honored. He is not to be forgotten, you know, even though his role is much less prominent in the church than it was as, as a body member. He's, he's at the prime of his life right now. So I change. Bad reason to separate from my spiritual father, okay? <clears throat> reason number two, which is a good reason. I hope it never happens to you, but it could, okay? Reason number two is that he changes, okay? And I've, I've been in this situation in my life. The guy who encouraged me to get ordained, who just, I, you know, I was served in his church for some years, and I was, I, you know, I was very, you know, faithful, active guy, um, you know, one, one Saturday, I forget how it went. It was like, um, I just remember the scene, you know. Um, it was one of these days where I was the only guy who showed up for outreach. You know, we did bus ministry, and I just showed up by myself, and I was the only guy who was there. And, um, and, and, he, and he showed up, and he said, geez, are you discouraged? And I just said, well, just I'm encouraging myself in the Lord, you know, that that phrase from, I think that's from David or something in the Old Testament, you know. And, and then later on, he made a statement that, you know, that at one time he, he was going on just because of me. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I gave him encouragement to go on. And then some years after that, there was just some things that happened. And, um, I, and now, I'm just going to, just in terms of full disclosure, I'm not going to name the guy. It doesn't matter who it is. I'm just giving it as an illustration in that specific case, I do not believe that there was a lifestyle problem with this individual. Uh, I believe it was just more, my opinion was it was self-image. He felt like he didn't measure up. There were some people in the church who wanted him to be like, more like Pastor Stevens. And guys, there's only one Pastor Stevens. Believe me, don't, you know, just be yourself. <laughs> don't, don't try and be Pastor Stevens. Um, and, but anyway, he... He, made it, he changed in the direction that he was going in. I couldn't go along with the change, didn't want to go along with that change. I wanted to be with us. I wanted to be with who we were. Um, there were some serious issues. Um, it wasn't just over nothing. It was like, you know, in terms of um, like uh, confrontational, what I call contact evangelism, being out knocking on doors and handing out tracts. He didn't do that. And then his philosophy of ministry was going in a certain direction. I was a youth pastor. I was preaching certain convictions. I wasn't hearing from the pulpit, and it was just time. We just we went separate ways, you know what I'm saying? And he changed, and I couldn't follow him. And I, I, I'm not saying I was right. I'm just saying that I, that was, in my mind, a valid reason to separate from a spiritual father. And then reason number three, I would say, uh, for, for a separation, would be the sovereign will of God. And this isn't so much a division in the heart, as it is a division of time and space and availability where I just no longer have the contact I once had and this individual is, um, is, is not the person that um, he was in my life anymore. And 
that's the way I kind of feel about uh, some of the individuals that were in my, when I was a youth pastor. I mean, I, you know, we, we had a great time up in the Berkshires. I was youth pastor for probably, I don't know, five or ten years. I forget the exact chronology of it. And, uh, you know, awesome relationships and, you know, just, just great time in my life. And, um, you know, so I moved down to Baltimore. Some of those folks came down here. I was like, hey, Pastor Tag. I was like, hey, but it was just what I was up there to them was just not, it just wasn't, and I couldn't, I couldn't manufacture it. And it was kind of like a bummer because I felt like I'm letting this person down. And, but it was just, it was what it was, you know, and it was time to move on to the next phase of life. And, and you know, it's also part of it when you're down here. It's like, you know, I'm not saying this is right, but it's like you got the pulpit, you know, what do you need me for? I, you know, I, I taught you everything I could. You've outgrown me, please, you know, get under Pastor Shaw and some of these other men and, and benefit from them. So that was, that was kind, of, kind of the thought also. So I would say that's a, a sovereign will of God separation, which might include, you know, the death or the infirmity of my spiritual father. He just no longer can do what he's doing or just, you know, God does something. But... <clears throat> In terms of being a matter of the heart, it's that the, the drawingness, it's, it's like voluntary accountability, like the draw is out of, really out of love. It's not out of obligation. It's like these, you know, you know who do I want to be in a room with on the face of the earth? Well, I want to be with my, you know, in a room with my wife. I mean, one person, probably my wife, you know? Next after that, I'm kind of torn. I'm not sure it's my children or my parents. You know what I'm saying? I visited my parents last week during, you know, a couple days during the play. I'm just the happiest person on the face of the earth sitting with my mom and dad at the dinner table. It's just like, it's just like, I just want to be there. I love them. They're great, great people. We went to the lobster pound. We bought one lobster. That's all we could afford. 18 bucks for a lobster. We split it four ways and we were like the happiest people. My dad, you know, 85 years old eating this lobster. It was like a wonderful time, you know, so you know, my children, my parents, and then after that, I, I want to be with the people that I'm close to in the Lord. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I want to be with you guys. I want to be with Pastor Schaller. I want to be with Pastor Stamboski. These are the people I want to be with. It's because of love. And, and certainly, you know, some of those individuals are spiritual fathers to me. But that, that uh, father relationship, brother relationship, whatever it is, there's a, there's a bond of love there. I don't do it out of obligation. I do it because I want to be. In a, a sense... We're not together because of God. If we're up to me, we would be together. Okay? So, <clears throat> there are some dangers that can happen. Um, and I had brought it up a few classes ago, and this was, I uh, dialogued a little bit with Pastor Ben about this. But there can be a danger where, um, and I'm not saying this happens a lot, but I think it can happen. And danger number one might be that the father uh, wants to keep, you know, wants to keep the son a child, okay? And that's my wife and I were talking the other day. We, our, our younger daughter's going on 16. You know, she's counting the days until she can get her own apartment and buy a car. And my wife said, you know, when she moves out, I'm going to cry. You know what I'm saying? And I, I could cry, but I, Guys don't cry, so I won't. But I just, you know, I, I, will, I miss my children when they're gone, but I know it's necessary and part of life. But as, as a spiritual father, I'm raising someone up in the Lord. I might want to hold that person with me, you know. I'm aware of one situation uh, somewhere in the world in Greater Grace World Outreach where I know that there's, there's a, a, a spiritual son who is sort of like chafing. He wants to be released. He wants to pastor a church, and, but he's not being allowed to leave, you know. It's in that, and that becomes or can become unhealthy. You start to get that, and sometimes when there's fighting in a church, that may be a symptom of another problem. It's not that people are divisive. It's just that a miscalculation has been made. It's time to let the bird fly the coop. You know? It's time to send him out to start his own church, to, you know, to, you know, do a Bible study, or take over this church and I'll go. I, I raised you up. I worked myself out of a job. I'm very happy to, to put you in charge, and I'm going to go, and a few people want to come with me. It's great, but, but that, that's like the healthiest thing in the world. And, you know, the trauma we went through here some, some years ago in this church, um, you know what? I, I, I think part of it was just there were guys who were, who were ready to be out, and in some, in some ways I was very happy about it because I thought it was very healthy, okay? So that's danger number one. The father will not let the son grow, but that's about... And on a scale of that's like a smaller danger. 
The bigger danger, in my opinion, from what I've seen over the years, and maybe this is maybe more characteristic of Americans, maybe it wouldn't happen so much in other cultures, I don't know. I haven't worked in those cultures so much. But the, what I think is the bigger danger is for the son to leave the covering. Okay? Thanks, Dad. Uh, you've taught me how to drive now. I'll take the keys. I got it. And then he goes out and, 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 and wraps the car around a tree. You know what I'm saying? Because he is not, doesn't quite have the maturity that he thinks he has. And, and really has need of someone that he thinks he no longer has need of. And uh, you know, so this is a person with like a, um, a security or insecurity problem where I need to be out on my own to feel good about myself, you know, and to prove who I am in God because I'm, you know, the finished work is not satisfactory to me. I need a role in the church, you know, a prominent role to, to prove who I am and who, what my spirituality is, and I don't need that guy anymore, you know. And that is, I think, more what we've seen uh, or what I think is a bigger danger, and that's really why we teach this is really hopefully to put into people's hearts you know, a, a godly need and reverence and respect for the people that are over us so that we do not outgrow them. You know, the illustration I give is, I, you know, I, you know I, <clears throat> I could have learned from my own dad. You know, I, uh, he, I never knew this, but it's a little bit on a different, little different subject now, but he always, he always paid cash when he bought cars. You know what I'm saying? He never told me that. I never knew that, you know? Um, you know, I was a young fool, you know, age whatever, late 20s, married, wanted to drive a nice car, went out and took out a car loan, you know? Um, and uh, got in over my head, and this was, by the time I was, you know, th this car affected my family financially for like a decade. The money we threw into it, and then paying off the credit cards we had taken out to throw money in the car. If I'd been humble enough to place a phone call to my dad, he could have saved me that heartache, you know? And one of the reasons I didn't, maybe, is because I didn't, I wanted to be making my own decisions and knew he probably would have told me no anyway, you know? And uh, so I just, in, in spiritual, I think that same thing can happen. So we want to be, um, be uh, humble in this that we, we don't want to leave our covering. And kind of the goal of this, what we're talking about here, is I want to put it this way, so that we would have in our hearts the maturity and the humility to stay in the place that God has put me. And that's for the benefit of me. It's for the benefit of, the, of my spiritual father and it's for the benefit of the body. You know, and those of us who have children, yes, sir? Um, I, I think, um, I think I make, it's a new point, I would probably say, you know. In terms of the outline of this class, if it's just a series of points, you know, without trying to have subtitles and everything, I think you'll do better that way. Because uh, I want you to be aware of all this, this information. And so it's, it's, a play, it's, it's me having the maturity and the humility to stay in the place that God has put me. And it's for the benefit of me. It's for the benefit of my spiritual father because he needs me. He needs my edification. I've got a 19-year-old you know, daughter. She's out of the house. She is one of my best friends on the face of the earth. She understands me like nobody else. I need her. I mean, I, it's not, I, mean I, I could live without her, but I wouldn't want to, you know? And, um, you know, Pastor Stamboski needs my friendship. You know, he, gets, he, gets, he, gets, he reaps the reward of his investment into my life. I love him, and, I, and I, I talk to him not a lot, but, but it's like there's something, you know, there's something there between us that is awesome and is beneficial to him. And if I cut that off, it would hurt him. And he'd be saying, why? Why is this happening? Have I changed? Have you changed? What's going on here? You know, and it would affect him that way. And then for the benefit of the body, so that I become all that I can become by, by gaining all that God has me from that person or from these people, and then the body gets the benefit of that. Is that a raised hand or just scratching your back? Okay, great. Scratching the back of your neck. Now, this verse, I got this from a booklet that's no longer in print, but it talks about, um, and I think we'll, we'll get into it 
um, next class a little bit. But it just talks about uh, some Old Testament. You've got Abraham and Lot. You've got David and Jonathan. Those are the two that come to mind. There's probably many others. I'm trying to think. Uh, maybe uh, Elijah and Elisha. And you'll like this st statement, um, is that these relationships were optional but not without consequence. They were optional, but not without consequence. Okay, So it matters very, very, very much whom I attach myself to in this life. Like that, that's, that, that, you know, who I decide to attach myself is crucial, you know? And uh, I attach myself to Pastor Stevens, when I went and I heard his preaching, I was like, I had never heard anything like this before. If God is real, this is what it should be like. It should be this important that it's people's lives. There should be people driving down from Maine to hear him preach if it's this important. You know, he should be going and getting in a car and going on to his next um, uh, a preaching engagement because it's that important. There should be people going into all the world. Okay? The pastor should be yelling at times to, to exhort the congregation to, to walk by every word of God. This is what it should be like. It shouldn't be a bunch of people in a church that are measuring each people by their morality, showing up in church on Sundays, you know, once a week, and then talking about each other or having, having no relationship once they walk out the door after that. That is what I saw prior to that in my life, for the most part, you know, with the exception of people that took me to you know, Bible-believing churches to Sunday school. So these relationships are optional, but not without consequence. And in one sense, it's totally your choice. Do what you want to do. I can do what I want. I'm free. I can get in my car tonight, go home, and never come back here again in my life. But there will be consequences to that action. There will be consequences. You, you would be saying, what's wrong? I thought you were our brother. And, you know, no communication, you know, cut off, you know. Um, you know, I, I, you know, but so in one sense, totally optional, but in another sense, as disciples of Jesus Christ, people in love with him, wanting to walk the way he wants me to walk, I have no choice in the matter. I must do what he has called me and led me to do, and I, and I, I must continue in the place that he's put me. And it's, it's, so we've we got to know the difference between carnal, fleshly, restlessness and a stirring of the Holy Spirit to move us to another place. And that knowing what the difference is is not always easy. And I do believe that God will bring in sometimes natural things that are bothering us just to kick us in the rear end so we can hear the stirring of the Spirit to get us to move. But then I know that other times it really is just carnality because I'm not satisfied with, with, with drinking and eating his flesh and blood and continuing in the calling that he's put me in. And, and, uh, and then I become, I have the wrong type of restlessness and then I start looking for adventures. You know, I want to go find something else to do because this is not enough for me. And, and that, that decision I'm talking about right there, that is like, that is the issue of life right there. You know, and God walks us through it. The Holy Spirit, Spirit leads us. But hopefully, the, uh, the person who's over you will have the wisdom and maturity when you come to him for counsel in those situations. I'm feeling a little bit restless. You know, maybe he can counsel you, you know, hang in there, give it some time. Six months, if you're still feeling the same way, let's talk again. Other times he might say, hey, you know what? If you want to try something else, go give it a shot. If it doesn't work, you can always come back. Or he might say, hey, let's pray about it. You know, we'll, we'll pray together on this for, for 30 days and then we'll come back and talk again. You know, this, this is what life consists of. So we're going to break it off there. We're going to come back at uh, 724. Whoops. This is not writing. Um, I, I probably just have a wrong button pushed here. There we go. Come back here at 724, and then we'll start on the second phase.